Okay, welcome back. Um, today we're going to talk about the audio component of virtual reality. Um, in the last lecture we finished up with um, what is mainly standard computer graphics material but with a particular virtual reality uh, perspective on it, talking about what the different kinds of problems are in our particular context. And um, you know, I finished up with that going over um, rendering techniques and um, eventually um, explaining some of the open challenges and problems that we face. So for today, let's look at audio for VR. Now remember, we've said this before, uh, vision is the most uh, fundamental and important uh, sense that we rely on in the human body and, and there, are, there are more neurons by far devoted to that sense than any other sense that we have. But nevertheless, um, we can stimulate other senses as part of the virtual reality experience and audio is an important um, component of that. So <clears throat> we might imagine in the real world, our ears are hearing sounds that are propagated from various sources. We want to somehow in a virtual reality generate um, sounds synthetically. So if we're in some kind of cave like virtual reality system, then um, it's a matter of generating appropriate sounds that are placed on some kind of, that are rendered let's say on some kind of speakers that are placed around in the environment in a fixed way, in the real world in a fixed way. If we have a head mounted display, then the user has their ears covered through some kind of earphones and their eyes covered through some kind of iPhones as we've said. And so this is what we get in the case of a head mounted display and we have to figure out what exactly needs to be rendered for the audio displays. Right? So you may imagine these are some kind of uh, speakers that are placed close to the ears and as the user turns their head um, how should the sound be adjusted accordingly, right? So all of the tracking methods that we talked about a few lectures ago, the information from that will also be useful here when you have a head mounted display presenting audio because you, you have to change the stimulus that's presented to the ears just like you have to change the stimulus that's presented to the eyes. And the same kinds of issues such as um, latency become important, there are resolution issues as well and um, other kinds of issues. <coughs> So let's think about it. We have sound waves that propagate through the physical environment. We can think of them as being similar to light. In fact, I think it's valuable to draw parallels between the propagation of light and the propagation of sound and then compare the visual sense, um, our vision sense to our auditory sense. So similar to light, um, except well, we have fluctuating air pressure um, instead of um, electromagnetic waves or photons. And so we're talking about fluctuations in air pressure waves, uh, fluctuation in air pressure which generates waves that have, um, you can imagine they're propagating waves, there's a compression part and there's a rarefaction part where it's decompressed. So it's compression and decompression um, as these waves move through space. <coughs> um, the frequency. The frequency range is only from let's say about as low as 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Which in the case of light is up to 10 to the 14th hertz. So much much higher uh, frequency for light. So we're talking about low frequency and speed is much lower. So say 343 meters per second in air as opposed to um, 3 times 10 to the 8th for light. So the speed, the, the much slower uh, speed that sound propagates compared to light will make a significant difference. It will enable 
um, <clears throat> certain types of perceptions that might not have been possible with light. So this ends up being um, interesting and the human body uses the fact that the propagation speed is slower in some cases. Um, let me go back to this board. We have the usual um, as we had for the case of light interacting with um, various media. You may remember we had the case of light waves coming in and we talked about absorption where they just seem to disappear into the material. So, same thing is true for audio waves. There will be some amount of absorption where the vibrations just get absorbed into the material. We also get some uh, transmission, it's very natural we can hear sound through walls. Some refraction of waves occurs in that case as well and of course we get uh, reflection of sound waves. So we can hear an echo back as sound waves are bouncing off of uh, buildings for example. And for the fourth case which we had before we can get a diffraction of sound waves. And so if you're if a sound source starts here and you're standing here with your ears you should be able to hear something right. So there's diffraction as well it will propagate the waves will propagate around corners bending. <coughs> um, there is some significant difference at this point um, when I went through light I started talking about optical systems right. We talked about using the power of refraction in order to make lenses that have some focal length. Why don't we talk about lenses for audio? You ever thought of that? So you could try to focus the um, the sound waves in some way to generate some kind of image so that you can tell exactly where the various uh, sound sources are right where the sound is coming from by um, by location along some kind of audio receptors that you have right. So, so we do not have that we have not seen that kind of thing before you may have seen cases of um, generating uh, let us say constructing some parabolic surface and then focusing the sounds so that when you put your ear right at some special nodal point you can hear um, all of the audio all of the sound waves that are being propagated within a large region so that you could hear someone whispering really far away for example. You may have seen something like that that would be the closest thing to a lens in, in this case right um, in the case of audio. But I just want to generally point out that the human vision system and in the same way that we, we handle audio in the real world we do not make things that are equivalent to images right. We do not have uh, audio images that go pixel by pixel and each audio pixel would be based in this hypothetical case on the precise location right that we are um, perceiving the sound coming from right. So, we do not have something equivalent to that. Um, presumably it is because of the large size of the waves in comparison to the tiny size of the light waves. So, that makes it very difficult to have some sort of high resolution audio image. Um, we do end up though with frequency spectrum uh, spectrum becoming quite important which is just like light. So, we may have a a pure um, a pure tone of sound which corresponds to a single sinusoid and in the uh, frequency spectrum. we may get then some particular spike that corresponds exactly to the frequency of the sinusoidal um, wavefront. <coughs> so, this would be let us say maybe the amount of power on this axis. So, the larger the amplitude the higher this gets, but the location here along the x axis the horizontal axis 
is based entirely on the frequency, right. So, this would be analogous to the colors of the visible spectrum that we talked about, right. And if you have a more complex wave, so maybe um some more complex wave. then the frequency spectrum would be more complex it may have uh, several components <coughs> So, a more complex wave can be considered as using um, a frequency spectrum or Fourier analysis as some <coughs> linear combination some adding of sinusoids that have various amplitudes and there can also be phase shifts as well. So, I am not really showing how they are shifted across time. So, you can imagine taking some number of sinusoids different frequencies different amplitudes and different phases adding them together to get some picture like this right. You can eventually go and even represent square waves if you put together an infinite number of these. Right. So, maybe you have had some background in signal processing maybe not, but if not I just wanted to at least leave it at this stage where just be aware that just like for light we have um uh, frequency spectrum corresponding to the waves that are propagating and uh, we have the simple case of pure tones and we have the more complex case which of course, is more uh, common in general for very uh, complex waves there is more there are more components than the frequency spectrum. All right, I want to describe the human auditory system now I am going to go over some uh, pictures for that and then we will get into the perception of sound. So, the outermost part of the human ear is called the the pinna um this is like a kind of funnel that directs the sound into the um external auditory canal. You have a tympanic membrane here um which we also know as the eardrum informally. So, the air pressure waves come in they cause the eardrum to uh, vibrate as a result of the sound pressure waves that have be that have come funneled in and then there is a sequence of uh, three bones here. So, this is some kind of kinematic structure um that in some ways translates or transfers these um vibrations of the eardrum or tympanic membrane over to this part here which is the entryway to the cochlea and inside of this part this the cochlea part here is a fluid and so, what are waves vibrating um corresponding to air pressure waves out here they become fluid pressure waves on the inside here and there is a sequence of bones here and some kinematic structure to connect these. So, that there is impedance matching between the waves on the outside that propagate through the air and transmitting those waves into the fluid that is inside of here. So, if you do not do some kind of um impedance matching then the air waves would very likely just bounce away rather than being transmitted. So, this complicated bone structure that we have inside here is to transmit the waves from air to fluid. So, once they enter inside of this region which I should point out by the way there are two different parts here and I will say a little bit about this. There is the cochlea part which is for um auditory sensing and then there is this upper part up here. Um, you can see what are called the semicircular canals, and this is part of the vestibular organ. So, your hearing and vestibular senses are very closely located and followed a very similar evolutionary path. There are a lot of similarities between them. In many ways, you may be able to consider the vestibular part as being the very, very low frequency component of your hearing. Um <coughs> So, here is again another depiction you have this external auditory canal you have the tympanic membrane vibrating you have this sequence of three bones and then that causes a vibration here and then there is this long coiled canal of fluid that has an an inner part and then the outer part and this is coiled up much more than the picture indicates and then along the interior inside of here there is a um a basilar membrane that contains um sensors here is another picture of this as well and so, I want to talk about what goes on as their fluid vibrates here there are there are pressure waves being sent through the fluid and these can be at varying uh, frequencies just as I said there is a frequency spectrum as you see on the board still there and so, um there are cilia or hairs 
inside that are responsive at different frequencies. So this particular center part inside of the cochlea, this membrane that it goes along, um, is narrower and stiffer. I don't think this picture exactly shows that, but it's narrower and stiffer um, near the beginning and as it goes further in, it becomes wider and more flexible. That makes it more responsive to lower frequencies when you're all the way near the end and responsive to higher frequencies when you come out to the, to the outside. So the cochlea is very much like a spectral analyzer and it has sensors inside, let's say, that respond. These are mechanoreceptors instead of photoreceptors because it's responding to vibration. So it has mechanoreceptors that respond to sound by producing this perfect or beautiful, let's say, um, frequency decomposition of the waves based on what location um, the waves are inside of this, um, inside of the cochlea. Um, if we zoom in significantly to the center part, if we're looking at a cross section of this inside, um, then <coughs> there's a displacement that occurs due to the vibration um, inside of this uh, fluid channel and these hairs bend a bit and this causes um, based on the frequency of vibration causes neural signals to be sent to the brain. And just as there's an optic nerve, there's an auditory nerve and just as there's a visual cortex, there's an auditory cortex that transmits the information. And so um, um, based on motion between this plate and this upper tectorial membrane, um, these vibrations are transmitted through this, what I, which what I said is a um, mechanoreceptor as opposed to a photoreceptor in the case of the eye. Um, this is another depiction of it as well and um, this is what it looks like um, under an electron microscope. And I just want to mention this um, vestibular part as well. Is everything okay there? I'm hearing sounds outside of the audio track so everything's fine. All right. Um, so I, I, also, I also want to mention the, um, the vestibular part as I showed in my early picture back here. Um, the vestibular organ is here as well. I just want to use this opportunity to mention this additional sense which becomes extremely important for virtual reality. I would say more so as a nuisance, right? Because um, when you have visual stimuli that are in conflict with your vestibular organ, as I said, that's the, the path towards simulator sickness and discomfort in virtual reality. So what's quite interesting is that there are mechanoreceptors as well in this portion. So the cochlea part is for audio but this other part here is for vestibular sense. There are three semicircular canals. They have the names here superior, horizontal, and posterior. What's interesting about these is that they are mutually orthogonal circular canals. They're only off by I would say within a couple of degrees of being orthogonal. So I find that really impressive. So that is a three axis sensor that essentially is an alternative to the gyroscope that we have in our MEM sensors. It's measuring angular acceleration in three independent axes close to orthogonal. Basically what happens is as you turn your head around, there's a fluid that compresses and decompresses along here. And let's say it's not a, a, a wave vibration like in the case of sound, but it's a very, let's say, low frequency wave. Imagine the, the fluid sloshing back and forth along the canal. That causes pressure on these membranes here. And there are, again, sensors that are mechanoreceptors that um, have little hairs that move back and forth as a co consequence of this fluid moving. So that transmits angular acceleration because of the fluid displacement. So isn't that fascinating? There's some viscosity to the fluid and so as it moves back and forth it causes some very low frequency pressure waves. In addition to that, there are these two um, parts here which are comprised what's called the otolith organ. There's the utricle and saccule and these have the, again the same kind of mechanoreceptors but these correspond to measuring of um, some amount of pressure that is due to gravity or linear accelerations which remember those two cannot be separated. So it turns out the utricle and saccule are the accelerometer components. Um, they are oriented 90 degrees with respect to each other so that um, there's a planar surface and the cilia or hairs displace. So you can measure two axes with one of them and you can measure two axes with the other. You get four axes total but of course you only need three independent axes so there's a little bit of redundancy. So you get the ability to measure 
both linear acceleration and angular acceleration. Remember that the gyros we use measure angular velocity, so it is a little bit different, but it is essentially the same information via integration of angular acceleration we get angular velocity information and by integrating that we get um orientation information. So, I find this amazing there are two immer inertial measurement units uh, one behind uh, each one of your ears right. And so, we have this while at the same time when we put an HMD on our heads we put an inertial measurement unit inside of that to measure orientation and then we seem to get upset when the brain using its own inertial measurement unit has recognized that there is a mismatch with the visual signal that we are sending right. So, so I think it is very interesting that we have an engineered IMU and a biological IMU and they are measuring pretty much the same thing which I find really fascinating all right. Um, that is what it really looks like if you were to cut out the vestibular organ and the um the cochlea as well. So, um <coughs> luckily it is not right before lunch all right. Um so, that finishes with the pictures. Now, I want to talk about the perception of sound remember when we covered uh vision we had photoreceptors that are um explaining the physical part you have the light waves coming in you have photoreceptors and then you had um layers of neurons that are performing some kind of low level filtering and the filtering or inference gets higher and higher level as it goes further and further back into the brain into eventually the visual cortex in the vision case. So, a similar thing happens with audio and the information goes back to the auditory um cortex and um as usual there seems to be some hierarchical processing and higher and higher level information um um gets inferred or perceived as as the signals get further from the source from the actual sense. So, I want to now talk about perception of sound <coughs> 